Hello and welcome back. This is edition number 39 of Joy Sightings. Today I'll be reading from The Wit and Wisdom of Safed the Sage. Safed the Sage was William E. Barton, and the PDF of this book is available at the Library of Congress, and I will post it also at our website on the Joy Sightings page. This was published in 1919 by the Pilgrim Press of Boston. I'm going to start a series of reading from this book and reading all of the things that I haven't read before. So, first of all, there's a foreword by the publishers. The constant request of readers who enjoy these little chapters of popular philosophy, good sense, and fun as they appear from week to week has led the publishers to issue this book. We are confident that wherever it goes, it will not only stimulate the cultivation of Safed's favorite flower, the hollyhock, and promote the appreciation of good donuts and cherry pie, but will carry the spirit of mirth and wholesome good cheer which have made these parables popular. Many readers have inquired the origin of the name Safed. As far as we know, no man except the author of these parables bears or has borne that name. He did not wish to choose a name either from the Bible or from the Arabian Nights, and so invented one. The name was not, however, invented wholly out of nothing. There is in northern Galilee a village called Safed, or Sephet, lying north and a little west from the Sea of Galilee, and plainly visible from the traditional site of the Sermon on the Mount, and believed to be the city set on a hill which cannot be hid. The author visited this site some years ago, and the name came to him somewhat spontaneously as a convenient one for the character which he has assumed in these chapters. We commend these chapters to all who enjoy either good fun, or good sense, or both. The Publishers I'll read the introduction by Safed himself next time. Today I will read the high cost of living, and the man in the upper berth, and when business was really good. The High Cost of Living Now the word of Keturah came unto me, saying, Hie thee unto the shop of the grocer, and buy thou for me a pound of butter, and certain other things whereof I have written down a list. So I went unto the shop of the grocer, and there entered an husbandman with money in his pocket, and more in the bank. And he spake unto the grocer, and he boasted, and he said, Behold, I have sold my wheat at the government price, and believe me, it was some price. Yea, and I got eighty-three for my oats, and one twenty-seven for my corn. And he was very proud of what he supposed he had done. And he spake to the grocer, and said, Give unto me a package of oatmeal, and behold, here is thy dime. And the grocer said, The oatmeal which was once a dime is now fifteen cents. And the husbandman said, It's an outrage! I will not pay it! Give me the breakfast food made of wheat. And the grocer said, That will cost thee more. And he said, Let me have the cornflakes. And the grocer said, That also is fifteen cents. And the husbandman said, 
The grocers are robbers, and the millers are thugs, and they are in a conspiracy to rob the poor farmer, whose industry feedeth them all. And he was wroth, and he departed. And he considered not the price at which he had sold his wheat, and his corn, and his oats. THE MAN IN THE UPPER BERTH There was a day when I took a journey, and I rode in a car of juggernaut, even a sleeping car. And I had bought my railway ticket and my Pullman ticket and paid the war tax, and I had a lower berth and was content. And there came into the car a passenger who had a ticket for an upper berth, and he was wroth, and he spake much concerning it, so that all that were in the car heard what he said, and he spake, saying, I'd like to know what kind of a one-horse road this is that can't put on cars enough to give its patrons decent service for I have never slept before in an upper berth, and I like it not. Now the man who hath never slept in an upper berth hath not slept many times in a lower berth. And I looked at the passenger, and I suspected that it was from motives of economy that he had taken the upper berth, and if he had bought a lower berth he would have gone without breakfast. Wherefore I let him talk, till he had told all who were in the car how sad he was at having to sleep in an upper berth, and I said to him, I have a ticket for a lower berth, and it cost me one dollar more than the upper berth, and the war tax is another dime. I will exchange berths with thee, and thou mayest give me a dollar and ten cents. And he began with shame to sidestep mine offer, and he said, Oh, I could not think of accepting a favor at the expense of thy comfort. And I said, I shall be comfortable in the upper berth, and more so for the comfort thou art to have in the lower one. And I called to the Ethiopian who accompanied that chariot, and I said, Move my things to upper seven, and give this man lower six, and come thou with thy fire escape, and I will go up. But the passenger began to sweat, so that cold drops stood on his forehead, and he said, I thank thee just as much, but I'm running a little short on my expense account, and if it's all the same to thee, I will go upstairs and save my dollar ten. And I said, Peace go with thee. And the other passengers began to snigger. And he went up very soon and was glad to go. And one of the other passengers came nigh unto me, and he laughed and said, Thou didst sure get his number. And I said, The man who hath little at home is the man who kicketh when he goeth abroad. And he who complaineth loudly at the small discomforts of travel is he who is getting all he is paying for and more than he can afford. And he said, I had not thought of it on this wise, but... I verily believe thou art right. When Business Was Really Good I have a friend who is a manufacturer, and I met him on a certain day, and I said, How doth it fare with thee in thy business? And he answered and said, I have more business than I can do. Men stand in line to give me orders, and ask no questions about price. And I said, Thou oughtest to be a happy man, but thou wearest a look of care. And he said, This thing of getting orders too easily is not what it's cracked up to be. I desire again the good old days when business was business. And I said, Tell me more about it. And he said, 
there be many things about it that I like not. One thing is this, that it hath disorganized my selling force, so that not in ten years shall I have it back in its old-time efficiency. There was a time when my traveling men covered the land from Dan to Beersheba and from Boston to Denver, and they were known in every wholesale house in the land. They laughed at fatigue, and at competition did they mock. They taught reluctant buyers to eat out of our hand, and they practiced the painless extraction of orders from merchants, till their salesmanship became a fine art. Now do those same traveling men sit in mine office with their feet on their desks and treat insolently the same merchants who come in to plead with them for goods. It is not good for a salesman or for a business that it should be on this wise. Therefore do I desire the good old days when business was business, when we knew we had the goods and had to get rid of them, and our salesmen had to get up and dust or get off the payroll. And I meditated much of these things, and I said, I am well persuaded that the good God knew that it was not well for men to achieve success too easily. Therefore will I the more patiently perform my part in the struggle of life. For God hath put us in a world where he who achieveth success must go out on the road and do business.